And welcome to the Dr. Bob Show. Why is it that every year at the same time, late August, September, and October, that we hear everybody sniffling and nasal congestion and nasal tone and maybe sinus infections and maybe a cough and maybe uh, itching and sneezing fits? Uh, is it a common cold? Uh, is it a COVID variant? Is it the fact that children are going back to school and when they're back to school, they're passing germs back and forth to each other? Or is it that old enemy or friend, ragweed hay fever? We'll be spending most of this show talking about ragweed hay fever. What is it? What is the ragweed plant? Does, how does that produce stuffy nose, runny nose, sneezing, and nasal congestion? My guest is Dr. Nicholas Kalinsky. Dr. Kalinsky is a board eligible allergist, just finished his training program, and he's got lots of information for you and me concerning ragweed hay fever. Hello, I'm Dr. Robert Overholt. I'll be your host for the next 30 minutes uh, as we'll be talking about how to stay healthy in the fall. Remember, it takes exercise. It takes getting adequate sleep. You've got to eat the right kind of foods and most of all, what is it we like? It's that laughter in your life. A lot of information for you. It's going to be a fun show and a great show. You'll want to stay tuned. We're talking with Dr. Nicholas Kalinsky, and we're talking about ragweed and ragweed causing nose problems and lung problems. Nick, welcome to the Dr. Bob Show. Dr. Bob, it's great to be here. Thank you. Hey, tell me, what does a ragweed plant look like? So a ragweed plant, it's a green plant, and uh -huh. it kind of looks like a fern, and it can grow kind of close to the ground, about a couple inches, or depending on the type of ragweed, it can grow up all the way to your waist. And it's got these tall finger-like projections that can be on the sides or on the top. And they're made up of these flowerets. And these flowerets actually have the male part of the plant, which is called the stamen. Ah. And the stamen holds all the pollen. So the fingers that are coming up on the outside of the plant, they're really where the flower is. You exactly. pull back a flower and it, it is sort of yellow looking, isn't it? Right, it is. To yeah. me, it looks like a little yellow cauliflower type stuff. <laughs> and, and they have the pollen grains there, is that right? Yes, sir, exactly. How many pollen grains will one plant have during the season? So you won't believe this, but a single plant can have one billion, with a B, pollen grains. A billion? A billion. So when you see them, there's frequently a field of ragweed plants mm -hmm. and so you got to multiply those number of plants by one billion uh, how easy is that pollen grain spread so if it's over in the field over there can i get it where most definitely so the pollen grains are actually really really small they're about five times smaller in diameter than a human hair and so it's light and very buoyant and so it can be carried by the wind for up to 400 miles that's about the distance between Knoxville and Memphis. Wow, 400 miles. Uh, I've heard it could go as far as two miles up in the air. That's correct. So you can't get, you cannot you avoid it no away. matter what you do. Well, well, there used to be another commercial, another something else that says, one of these days I'm going to get you. <laughs> so the ragweed pollen, how does it produce allergy symptoms? So when our bodies become in contact with the ragweed pollen, either through the eyes, the nose, the mouth, or the lungs, our body recognizes that pollen is foreign, and yeah. it creates this allergy molecule called IgE that binds to that pollen. And what ends up happening is that IgE is connected to an inflammatory cell called a mast cell. And what happens with the mast cell and the inflammatory IgE to ragweed? So whenever that pollen is connected to the ragweed that's connected to the mast cell, it bursts. And whenever it bursts, it releases all these inflammatory mediators like histamine. Now what does histamine do? So histamine is a bad 
chemical, okay? <laughs> it's a bad actor. <laughs> exactly, and so histamine causes vessels to dilate, and whenever the vessels dilate, they swell, and the tissues around them swell, causing the stuffy nose, and then the mucus, and all these allergy symptoms that we're used to. Does it cause a runny nose? Most definitely. Itching? Of course. How bad? Real bad. <laughs> <laughs> so, we used to call this the allergic salute, when somebody would rub their nose. What does the inside of the nose look like if it's allergic, if they've got ragweed hay fever? So the inside of the nose will look swollen, pale, kind of boggy. There might not be a lot of room, so you just see this enlarged tissue in the nose. There might be some mucus or some drainage as well. An infected nose, that's the allergic nose, pale, wet, boggy, sloppy looking. What does the infected nose look like? The infected nose might have brown mucus or yellow mucus, look a little bit red, angry, so it looks different for sure. And a normal nose? A normal nose just looks pink, healthy, maybe not a lot of swelling. There's some space in there where someone can breathe naturally, yeah. so it's nice. So when the ragweed nose is swollen on the inside, is this swollen enough where you can't breathe and you're really stuffy? It definitely can be for some people, especially if they have enlarged tissue in the nose at baseline. And then whenever they come in contact with a ragweed pollen, all it takes is a little bit of swelling and all of a sudden they're stopped up. What is the uh, characteristic of the sneezing? You sneeze a big sneeze here and a big sneeze there or you get fits of sneezing? It's more fits of sneezing. So classical sneeze is just they come in patients do and they tell you I can't stop sneezing and then that's really the the thing that gives it away how miserable would you say it makes people I would say very miserable so yeah. I have seasonal allergies as well and it used to interfere with my school ability to focus and it took me seeing an allergist to get better and get treatment so it cuts down on your focus so what causes that not itching of the nose or sneezing fits well, sometimes it's just lack of good sleep and you're not really able to breathe through your nose and you're breathing through your mouth and you're tossing and turning. And that's at least what it was like for me and a lot of my patients. And those inflammatory mediators with that reaction also make people feel sort of exactly. to, to pop and with that. Is there good treatment? Yes, sir. There's fantastic treatment. So how do we treat it? So the easiest thing would be to avoid the allergen. So but if it's going on... Uh, Hundred, if it's floating around a hundred miles or two miles up in the air, is it hard to avoid? Most definitely, it's almost impossible. Uh, yeah. So you kind of have to go out when the pollen's not going to be there. So it's either going to be out of season, or it's going to have to. You're going to have to go inside, keep the windows closed, keep the air conditioning on, things like that. And then of course there's medications. So we have our nasal sprays, our allergy pills. However, those seem to be just like a band-aid to treat the allergy, whereas something like immunotherapy is a cure. Now, immunotherapy, what would that be? That's allergy shots. Okay, let's go back to the medications before we go with the shots. What is a good spray? A really good spray would be a nasal steroid. I think that that is a great spray, can decrease some mucus production and also decrease some swelling in the nose. So, uh, intranasal steroid spray, like Flonase? Exactly. Or Nasacort, right, or some of the others. Mm -hmm. Are they, is one of them any better than another? No, sir. I wouldn't necessarily say so. Some of them have different age ranges or indications, but they all work very similar. Side effects of the cortisone nasal spray. So, if you're using the nasal spray and if you're not pointing towards the outer ear on the left side towards the left ear, right side towards the right ear, you might get some irritation of the septum, and the septum is what divides the left side of the nose from the right side. So you get some irritation, bleeding maybe? Even. You can, for sure. Hole in the septum? You may. So you got to know how to use your medications. So exactly. If it's an intranasal steroid, you spray toward the outside right there. Uh, what, tell me about the antihistamines. So antihistamines, you can either take a pill like a Zyrtec, Claritin, Allegra, or there's also topical antihistamines like a nasal spray, uh -huh. and those also work really well. What's the name of a topical nasal spray? So azelastine would be one, or olipatidine would be another example. It would seem like those would be good because you're putting the antihistamine on the nose where the problem is, is that correct? Yes, sir, exactly. And the problems with the pills like Zyrtec, Allegra, Claritin, 
Uh, what would be the problem with those? Sometimes you can have more systemic side effects that you don't want, like dry mouth or even crossing the blood-brain barrier and causing you to feel tired, drowsy, things like that. Uh, how long do they last, those antihistamines? Well, it depends. Uh, the pill. The pill, it may last 12 hours. So you have to take it twice a day like that. Uh, are they effective? They are effective, but they're not as effective as the nasal sprays. Okay. So if you had one medicine, use the intranasal steroid. Yes, sir. How much relief does that give you? I would say in the average patient, about 70%. About 70%. Mm -hmm. And you have to take it the entire, every day, the entire season. It works best if you do use it every day. However, you know, some people find, everyone's different. So some people might use it a couple of days and then give it a break. You mentioned immunotherapy. Is that effective? Yes, sir. Very effective. And that's what we're going to be talking about when we come back. Immunotherapy, big long word. What does it mean? How does it work? How effective is it? And does it have any problems? A lot of information you want to stay tuned. We're talking with Dr. Nick Kalinsky, and we're talking about ragweed and ragweed pollen and how it causes ragweed hay fever. The ragweed plant Mm, looks like a fern with little fingers sticking up on the side. The fingers have the flower. The flower has the pollen. The pollen gets in the air, finds itself to the nose, where it can cause stuffy nose, runny nose, itching, sneezing fits, drives people crazy. They can't think, they can't eat, they can't breathe, makes sleeping difficult because you, your nose is so stuffy. And it makes it where you can't, can't concentrate in school or your work day is not as productive. It's really a big time, huge problem. Good medications, intranasal steroids like Flonase is a common one. There are topical antihistamines or antihistamine pills that also help, but the steroid sprays are the best. And if those don't work or if those are not giving you the relief that you want, we talked about immunotherapy. Now, before we get to immunotherapy, like I promised, uh, we're going to talk about the diagnosis. How, how do you know that it's ragweed hay fever and that it's not uh, due to COVID, it's not due to a virus that somebody's caught at, at school, a change in weather pattern? So how do, you, how, how do you make the diagnosis? Well, the best way is the skin test. It's actually the best test that we have. And then we also have a blood test as well. So tell me about the skin test. What's it like? So the skin test is very easy. It's simple. It takes about 15 minutes to read. And we do it throughout all ages. And we'll take a little toothpick kind of thing. It's plastic. We'll prick the back a little bit just with all the different allergens. And then we'll see what has a reaction. And you, the reaction... Do you put the allergens on and then prick? Or do you prick and then put the allergens on? So usually the prick comes from the allergen extract and then you can ah, put it right onto so the skin. so you dip it in there and then you, does it bleed? No. Okay, but it scratches the skin. Correct. And, and what is a positive, how does that tell you you've got ragweed problems? So a positive is what we call a wheel and a flare reaction. A wheel and a flare, okay. Tell yes, me sir. About a fl tell me about wheel and flare. So a wheel is an elevated part where there's some inflammation there and it's something that you can feel, whereas the flare is the redness and around the wheel. So if you get a ragweed wheel and flare, uh, how big is the flare occasionally, frequently? It could be bigger than three millimeters. Okay, three millimeters, that's not very big. Can it be as big as 20 millimeters? Yes, so it can. So big as a quarter, big as a 50 cent piece, that's the redness, the flare. Right. How about the wheel part, the raised part. So the raised part would be like the three millimeters. I think I misspoke earlier. That's right. The flare is larger. So it can be a three millimeter. Can it be a eight millimeter? It can be if it's severe enough of a reaction. So it could be as big as your fing little fingernail, perhaps the the wheel mm -hmm. and the flare is is redder. Now, Correct. which is the most important to read? The wheel or the flare? The wheel. The wheel is, and mm -hmm. so the wheel will tell you something really big time's going on. Now, when you skin test somebody, do you skin test them just to, well, it's the fall of the year, I'm just gonna do ragweed. What else do you do? So we'll also test for trees, grasses, ragweed, of course, dust mites, cat, dog, cockroach, 
a lot of things can cause allergies. Those are things you skin test too because it identifies what you're allergic to, what's bothering the nose, mm -hmm. and it also is that where immunotherapy, is it effective in most of those things you just with trees, grasses, weeds, dust, dogs, cats? Most uh, definitely, for so sure. So it's effective in those. Mm -hmm. When you say effective, what do you mean in comparison with the sprays like Flonase? Well, I would say that people that go on immunotherapy, about 80% or more have a positive response where they're decreasing their use of their nasal spray, they're able to function better, they're not using so much medications, and generally people like that. They feel better. Did you go on immunotherapy? I did. Did yes, it help sir. you? Of course. Did it make you where you could sleep better? Yeah. That's <laughs> why I'm so happy to be here today. <laughs> that, uh, that's right. So th that's the skin testing. You mentioned there was one other type of diagnostic test. Correct. And that would be the blood test. And what's that called? RAS test. So that's a RAS test, uh, and the RAS test is more expensive, I've heard, mm -hmm. and also is not as accurate as the skin testing is, per se. So when you decide that you want to use immunotherapy and you've skin tested and you've got reactions to trees and dogs and ragweed, because that's what we're talking about, how do you decide, how do you make up the formula to inject? Well, of course, you know, you got to start with a strong history from the patient. You know, what do you feel like you have an adverse reaction to, whether it's the stuffy nose, itchy, watery eyes, and then you take those allergens that the patient has a positive history to, and then you create the vials from that. So it's the history and the skin testing that leads you to figure out how you're going to make up their extract. And 80%, it seems to be a life-changing situation where you get things under control, don't have to use as much medication. That same sounds pretty good. I'd say so. Um, let's go on and talk about asthma. Uh, when people breathe in ragweed, can it cause lung problems? Most definitely, yes. And the lung problems, what would they, what symptoms would somebody have? So if someone might cough, they feel like their airway is closing down, their chest gets heavy, tight, things um, like that. So cough, wheeze, tight chest, short of breath, mm -hmm. uh, how long does that last? Well, it could last a while if it's bad enough and if they don't seek appropriate care. How about a child that goes outside in the fall of the year and runs around and starts to cough and has a little wheeze? Could that be ragweed asthma? Most definitely. Uh, how would you treat that? If, if your little, bo your young boy uh, went outside and played in the playground and got cough and said, Daddy, I don't feel good, my chest is tight. How would you treat that? So something that's very interesting. So 80% of pediatric asthmatics are allergic asthmatics. And so it could potentially be with immunotherapy or I might give them a rescue inhaler, the ones that you see people use in the movies whenever they feel short of breath. Or so, I might add a maintenance inhaler as well. So let's talk about when you say rescue inhaler, what it rescues the attack? It can, or it can dilate your inside of your lungs to where you're able to breathe better. So can you use that before you go outside? You definitely can, and especially young athletes that might have these types of symptoms. 30 or 15 minutes before, you can use your inhaler and you can feel better and perform. I've read that the first uh, person to run a sub four minute mile, a gentleman named Jim Ryan, uh, was an asthmatic and he used his inhaler before he ran. He was able to, be, to beat the world's record at that time. So you mentioned using that spray uh, and you mentioned some controllers, some further treatment with asthma. Is it effective? Yes, sir, it is. And that's what we're going to be talking about when we come back. If you've got asthma, it can be a real problem. Uh, it can cause really very significant problems of feeling like you're smothering with cough, wheeze, and shortness of breath. And there's medications that'll work just as good as those intranasal steroids will for a stuffy nose. You want, want to stay tuned. <laughs> We're talking with Dr. Nick Kalinske, and we've been talking about allergies and their diagnosis and their treatment. 
And then we started talking a little bit about asthma and some treatment for asthma. We talked about the diagnosis with allergy skin testing to find out what you're allergic to. You may think uh, that all you have is a cold. It may be ragweed hay fever that's causing your problem. Or you may think it's ragweed hay fever. It may just be the common cold. Now we want to talk a little bit about asthma. We talked about the child that went out on the playground and began to cough and wheeze, mm -hmm. and they had a reliever medicine. What's an example of one? Albuterol. So albuterol, how do you use that inhaler? So whenever you use your albuterol inhaler, you can shake it. Shake it up, get okay. it ready. Make your gun, yeah. okay? Put it to your mouth, start the breath first, and right after, uh, one, two. two. Count to 10, and then breathe out, and that's one. Why do you have to hold it in there? For the medicine to start to work? Exactly. Okay, now with asthma, if somebody's got it a long time, and by that I mean they've had it for a year or so, what's going on in the airway if somebody's got asthma? Well, there's a lot of inflammation, and there's some bronchoconstriction, which closes down on those tubes in the lung. So bronchoconstriction, the tubes are called bronchial tubes? Exactly. And Inflammation, is that on the outside or the inside or right through the middle? Where is it? It's on the inside, right there. Okay, so it causes swelling in there, narrows the airway, and the bronchospasm is due to what? Smooth muscle contraction around the bronchi. Uh, and which is easier to treat, the inflammation or the bronchospasm? So the bronchospasm, <clears throat> probably, the inflammation can sometimes be chronic and take a long time to recover from. Which is the most important that you start treatment with? A bronchodilator, which seemed like that would be the best one, or anti-inflammation? So you, depending on the patient, you might want both. You know, anti-inflammation is a great thing, and some inhalers are just anti-inflammatory with inhaled steroids. And there's other inhalers that also have the long-acting beta agonists that work to relax that smooth muscle, and then also a steroid combined that decreased that inflammation. Whoa, so you've got combination of those. Now, the reliever you said was albuterol. Uh, the controller, if you want to start controlling asthma, cut down the frequency of the episodes, what do you prefer? An inhaled steroid, the combination, what, what do you like? So depending on the severity, uh, will depend on whether I want to do just the steroid or the combination, but usually we'll just start out with an inhaled steroid. And that takes care of? The inflammation. And when the inflammation goes away, the lungs relax and you can start to breathe normal. Exactly. Uh, if that's not good enough, then you add? Then we'll add the long-acting beta agonist, so, so the combination inhaler. So what are some of the medicines that have a combination of both an inhaled cortisone medication and a long-acting bronchodilator. So there's Symbacor, there's Dulera, there's a long list of medications and every year almost that list gets longer. So Symbacor is one, Dulera is another one. And those have both bronchodilators and inhaled steroids to get the patient better. Now, how can you tell whether the patient's getting better what test do you have available? So we can use something called the ACT score, where uh -huh. they're going to come in and they fill out this questionnaire, and based off this questionnaire, we can tell if they are controlled or not controlled. Or we have a breathing test called spirometry. Spirometry, what's that like? So I've actually done it myself before, and it's kind of fun. You breathe out and breathe in, and it shows you the waveforms that you make with your lungs. It's pretty interesting. Uh, are you pretty good? You're a big guy. Well, I, you know, I tried hard whenever I did it, so. <laughs> <laughs> so for your age and for your size, that computerized breathing curve is adjusted to how tall you are and how tall I am and our, our age and all of that. Can it pretty much tell you how bad your lungs are, spirometry? It can, it gives us a good idea. What's pre and post? So pre and post, that's two steps to the spirometry, so pre, is just doing the spirometry without a medication. Post is after you have inhaled something like albuterol to help open up your lungs to see if there's any reversibility. And reversibility means improvement because you use that inhaler. Exactly. Uh, is that what you expect to see in somebody who's got asthma? Yes. 
So we've got spirometry, we've got immunotherapy, we've got medications for asthma, we've got medications. So really it's pretty much fun being an allergist. That's fantastic, so I love you, it. So you can handle that ragweed hay fever problem. Of course. Uh, Nick Kalinske, you're a great, great teacher. I want to thank you for coming to the Dr. Bob Show, and I hope that you'll come back again to help us learn more about allergies and how they can be treated for a better life. I'd love to. Thank you, Dr. Bob. Uh, that's all the time we have right now. Remember those four things that we like. Number one, it's exercise. If you exercise, it will take care of stress, it'll lower your blood pressure, you'll feel better, you'll get a runner's high, there's something about running that just makes you better. Seven and a half hours sleep. In general, that's the average. If you get seven and a half hours sleep, your brain will get rested, that's always good. You'll think better, you'll be happier, the people around you will be better, they'll be happier. Eat properly, eat fruits and fibers and get rid of that fat old greasy stuff. And most of all, what is it that we like in the Dr. Bob show? It's that laughter in your life. Find somebody that you want to laugh with, that you want to giggle with, because when you're happier, you're gonna be healthier and the people around you will feel better.